You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello and welcome to episode 330 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Kovart. In an 1815 letter to Massachusetts Senator James Lloyd, John Adams famously stated, quote, I should say that full one-third of Americans were averse to the revolution. An opposite third gave themselves up to the enthusiasm and gratitude to France. A middle third, always averse to war, were rather lukewarm both to England and France, end quote. Now, although Adams was writing to Lloyd about American support for the French Revolution, his ideas about thirds when considering questions of loyalty came to stick when trying to describe sentiments and loyalties during the American Revolution. The reality is, we'll never know for certain how many Americans supported the American Revolution, remained loyal to the British Crown in Parliament, or tried to find a middle way as someone who was both on the fence or disaffected from either loyalty. Now, while we'll never be able to precisely measure Americans' loyalties during the American Revolution, we can know about the different ideologies that drove people to support the revolution, to remain loyal to Crown and Parliament, or to become disaffected from both sides. Brad Jones, a professor of history at California State University, Fresno, is a historian who studies loyalism in the British Atlantic world during the American Revolution. He joins us today to help us investigate what loyalists believed and how loyalism wasn't just a loyalty or ideology adopted by British American colonists in the 13 rebellious colonies, but by Britons across the Atlantic world. During our investigation, Brad reveals how and why we should view the American Revolution as a civil war, the central role Protestantism played in Britain's sense of Britishness, and ways the ideas of the American Revolution caused ideas about loyalism to develop, and how those ideas developed and took hold in the broader British Atlantic world. But first, are you ready for a meetup? Come join me in New Orleans on Saturday, July 23rd at 4 p.m. We'll meet up at Pat O'Brien's Courtyard Restaurant. Now, meetups are a fun way for me to meet you and to get to know you better, and they're fun for you because you'll have a chance to meet other listeners and we'll all get a chance to talk about early American history. Now, as we'll be meeting at a restaurant, please let me know if you're coming or you're thinking about coming so I can make a reservation. You don't have to eat at this restaurant if you don't want to, but it would be helpful for us to get a table that everyone can fit at. So please let me know if you're coming or if you think you'll be coming at benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. Okay, are you ready to investigate loyalism, its ideas, and how Britons across the British Atlantic world viewed and considered the American Revolution? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is a professor of history at California State University, Fresno. His research specialties are in the American Revolution, the Atlantic world, the 18th century British Empire, and popular politics. He's written numerous articles and a book, Resisting Independence, Popular Loyalism in the Revolutionary British Atlantic. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Brad Jones. Thanks, Liz. I'm happy to be here. Really excited to talk with you today. And I'm glad you're excited, Brad, because we have a lot to talk about today. In fact, we should probably just cut to the chase and dig right on in. So in your book, Resisting Independence, you contend that the American Revolution was not only a movement of reform and of independence for the young United States, but that it was also a civil war. And you believe that the revolution as a civil war is really the frame through which we should view the American Revolution. So Brad, would you tell us how and why you think we should view the American Revolution as a civil war? Simply put, it was a civil war because it was people of the same country fighting against one another. I think certainly in the colonies, and, and certainly when you think of the loyalists, that's especially true in that the loyalists and patriots will in fact fight against each other, brothers, fathers, 
families are split, coworkers, you know, friends, family members, neighbors go to war against one another. And we're especially aware of that in places like the Carolina backcountry and later in the war. That's definitely a civil war, but I think it's true everywhere. I think it's also important to think of it as a civil war, the revolution, because it allows us to think of the American colonists as British subjects. We tend, when we think of the revolution, to think of the Americans as separate from the rest of the British Empire. It's my contention that they're British subjects like everyone else. That's certainly a debated topic during this period. But in doing that and getting them to see they're British also, it complicates the story of the revolution. If it in fact is a civil war and it's pitting people of the same nation against one another, that espouse similar views as to what it means to be British and what it is they're fighting or defending against, then it complicates that story. And it forces us to think more seriously, I think, about what the revolution's about, what the war is about. And it also then turns it around and says, well, there are people that opposed it, the loyalists. Why might they oppose if they're also British subjects, if they're common neighbors and family members and so forth? Why would they disagree with this movement? What I think is really interesting here is that when most historians talk about the American Revolution as a civil war, they're talking about revolutionaries and loyalists within British North America fighting each other. That's the nation, British North America. And what you're talking about is the entire British Empire. You're seeing Britons coming from all over the British Empire in the British Army to fight the Britons who happen to be living in British North America. And I think that's really interesting because I think when we read a lot about this, we get the impression that by the American Revolution, North Americans are really kind of a distinct people, like they're British in name only. You know, it's my contention that in the 18th century, there does develop a sense as to what it means to be British. And I refer to this as a British identity, or the term often other historians have used, and I use also as like a Britishness, like this sort of culture of being British develops. And it's true everywhere. In fact, it's especially true in the American colonies. I mean, at the end of the Seven Years' War, when it came to sort of thinking about being British or being patriotic to Great Britain, it's especially true in the American colonies that American colonists saw themselves as British subjects. Now, what does that mean? You know, and I'm not the first to say this. It's building off works of like Linda Colley and Stephen Pincus and others that to be British in the 18th century is to celebrate a nation that protects political freedom or liberty. It promotes economic prosperity. And this is certainly true in the American colonies. White American colonists were a free people in the context of the 18th century. They were a wealthy people. This is true throughout the empire, but especially in the colonies, and that they were a Protestant nation. And that's sort of the crux of how I sort of frame my book is that they were a Protestant nation. So the empire in the 18th century was enormous, the British Empire after the Seven Years' War. It encompassed most of the East Coast of North America, parts of the Caribbean, venturing into India and Southeast Asia, and of course, the British Isles. And central to this sort of notion of to be British was that they were a Protestant nation. Now, that was understood in a religious sense. You had to be Protestant. And they pitted that against Catholicism. It was illegal in most parts of the empire to be Catholic in the 18th century. But they equated Protestantism with this idea that the Protestant faith actually promoted a free and wealthy society, that Protestantism in and of itself made people free. You know, and I'm speaking very generally here. Protestantism required individuals to be literate, to be able to read the Bible. Salvation was achieved for the individual connection to God. And so this required people to think for themselves. This is at least what 18th century Britons would have argued, to be more literate. And that Protestantism then established a kind of a freer society that allowed people to pursue wealth and argue for political rights and freedoms. And they positioned that against Catholicism which they equated with tyranny and oppression. And they especially caged that around sort of France, their great nemesis in the 17th and 18th century, which was a Catholic nation. And they believed that Catholicism, because it was sort of a hierarchical faith, which salvation was controlled by the church, that it produced a slavish or uneducated and illiterate population. And so this very simple sort of relationship or division between Protestantism and Catholicism comes to define how British people see themselves. And the fact that they're at war against France for most of the 18th century, you know, most American colonists at the start of the American Revolution, adult American colonists, would have only really known a world of war against France, most famously with the Seven Years' War that had just ended in 1763. And so you've got this nation that's built around a diverse empire, built around this Protestant identity. And then constantly having to fight against Catholic enemies, whether it's France or also Spain, 
it begins to sort of develop into this kind of national identity that they attach to. And the victory in the Seven Years' War really is a confirmation of all of this, right? It's a celebration of being a part of this Protestant empire. And so, you know, back to this idea of the Civil War, then the challenge then becomes, these are Protestant Britons fighting Protestant Britons now. At least initially, France isn't a part of this war. And so how do you make sense of this? this is the Civil War. How do you make sense of it? Whether they're soldiers coming over or are colonists themselves, they're for the most part, for the most part, not entirely, Protestant. And they all believe in this sort of notion as to what it means to be British. So how do you differentiate yourself? How do you separate yourself? How do you, in a war, begin to define somebody as an enemy that is your friend and believes the same things as you and is attached to a similar kind of identity that you are? It's complicated. It's messy. And it, it's ultimately very violent as a result of this. As we consider the American Revolution as a civil war and further investigate how it made people think and feel about their loyalties to the British Empire, I think it would be helpful if we had a starting point. So, Brad, we know from speaking with many different historians that trying to define when the American Revolution began is a really contested issue. But like many scholars, you do pick your own start for the American Revolution. And in your book, Resisting Independence, that start is in 1765 with the Stamp Act. So would you remind us of what the Stamp Act crisis was and what this crisis looked like within the geography of the larger British Atlantic Empire? Sure. So the Stamp Act crisis begins in 1765. Quickly, the Stamp Act was a legislation passed by Parliament. It was a direct tax, the first time Parliament had ever tried to directly tax their colonies. And it was a tax on printed items. It was a relatively minuscule tax, a stamp tax that existed in England and Scotland for a long time. And the objective of the tax, like most tax, not all most, was to raise revenue. And this is a time in which after the Seven Years' War, the British Parliament with the government was particularly in need of money as a result of having fought that war. You know, they're looking for ways to generate revenue. Now, the problem, of course, is that for the colonists, that the Stamp Act is passed. And we know the Stamp Act is famous because, you know, they're taxed without their consent. And colonists don't have representation in parliament. So it's really an ideological dispute more so than an economic dispute, right? It's not necessarily the cost, although some like newspaper printers do complain about the cost of the tax. And some will say this, but rather the bigger dispute is over the right of parliament to tax colonists without their consent. So this occurs in 1765. Now, I do begin there. I begin there because I argue that the British Empire in 1765, as I conceive of, is relatively new. You know, it's only since 1707 with Scotland's union with England that we get Great Britain formed. And then it's really from there. So we're talking, you know, five decades, six decades old. The Stamp Act crisis is, I think, the first real imperial crisis to hit the British Empire. It's an event that's not an event of only of importance to the 13 American colonies. We shouldn't just consider the Stamp Act crisis as, say, a prologue to the American Revolution. It's an imperial event. The tax is passed against all of Britain's 26 colonies, the colonies in the Caribbean, the Canadian colonies. Everyone's meant to pay this tax. It's of importance to everyone. Glaswegians, who are people that live in Glasgow, they're struck by this tax. They write about it. They talk about it. There are riots and protests and demonstrations and inflammatory publications that appear everywhere in the North Atlantic. So it really is an Atlantic event, a British Atlantic event, an imperial event. And I begin there because, you know, what I realized with the Stamp Act crisis is that for the most part, American historians writing on the American Revolution like to think of it as the start of the American Revolution. But the reality of the Stamp Act crisis is that it actually, in the end, works in favor of this kind of British imperial identity. It's not a popular tax anywhere. It's despised everywhere. This is the thing. Glaswegians don't like it. They actually agree with the American colonists that it's unconstitutional. And they're especially concerned with the threat it may pose to their trade with the colonies. It's disliked in Jamaica. It's disliked in Nova Scotia. It's disliked in the colonies and throughout the 13 American colonies. But it's repealed. It's made public in the spring of 1765. It goes into effect November 1st, 1765. And it's repealed on March 18th, 1766. So it's in circulation for several months. Only of my cities that I study, only Kingston and Halifax actually pay the tax. New Yorkers refuse to, but it's repealed. And there are massive celebrations. There are actual celebrations in Glasgow for the repeal of the Stamp Act that affects the colonies. In all of these celebrations, what they're saying, what British subjects are saying is, 
our empire, our system of government is great. Okay, Parliament tried to do something really bad, but we protested because we're free. We have a right to, you know, it's a little out of hand in some places, but we have a right to protest. We are free to publish essays and editorials and newspapers critical of the tax. We are free to petition our government to say that it's unjust or unconstitutional. And they listened. They repealed it. And the system works. So it's not as though in 1766, we're one step closer to revolution, which is, I think, often how the Stamp Act crisis is presented. It's rather than 1766, the Stamp Act crisis kind of proves that Great Britain, the British Empire, is really this empire committed to liberty. Humans are corrupt and prone to sort of selfish and corrupt acts, as members of parliament were, but it was fixed. It was corrected. And so that's what I think is interesting about the Stamp Act crisis is not that it begins the revolution, but rather, really, I think I describe it as sort of the last moments of this sort of British imperial unity or identity, and that it actually brings people together. Now, things will start to fall apart thereafter, but I don't think the crisis necessarily is where it fully begins. Brad, you're really throwing a monkey wrench into our view of how the Bostonians revolted against the Stamp Act in August 1765 by destroying Andrew Oliver's stamp office and Thomas Hutchinson's home, and then how New Yorkers and Philadelphians erupted into protest over the act, and that it was these riots and mob actions by patriotic Americans that led to the repeal of the Stamp Act. I mean, from the way you describe it, it sounds like everywhere in the British Empire was upset and erupting into protests over the Stamp Act of 1765, and that its repeal came not necessarily because of these specific protests in British North America, but because Britons all over the empire were upset about this tax. So Halifax and Kingston or Jamaica and Nova Scotia, they both pay the tax. And there are reason for this, but they actually protest it. I mean, I think my favorite stamp tax distributor's name is Archibald Hinchelwood, who's the stamp distributor for Nova Scotia. You know, he's basically walking around Halifax with a military guard fearing his life. There was a crowd that had hanged him in effigy and threatened to murder him. In Jamaica, the stamp collector there, John Howe, he arrives in Kingston. He's chased out of Kingston. He goes to Spanish Town, which is the quote unquote capital of the colony and where sort of wealthy planters mostly live. And he has a better sort of degree of protection there. So he sort of survives. But it's enormously unpopular in these places. And so it's not just the 13 million cause, but it is violent. So what I would say is if we're looking for ways in which we're starting to see loyalism, change a bit. And this is the point of my book is the sort of the evolution of loyalism and what it means to be a loyal British subject is that really the division that starts to emerge in the empire is not over the stamp tax or whether or not it's a good piece of legislation. It's resoundingly rejected across at least my four cities, which represent a pretty broad swath of the Atlantic empire. But it's rather the methods of resistance. So you mentioned Andrew Oliver and particularly the riot in Boston, which is very violent. New York City, because you know they tried to storm the fort and threatened to murder the lieutenant governor. This is where we start to see differences, especially amongst Glaswegians. They're in agreement that's a bad piece of legislation, but they start to criticize methods of protest or methods of resistance. And this becomes a big component, I argue later on, of loyalism, is that loyalists are committed to an idea of a society that promotes freedom, wealth, and Protestantism. But they're fearful of sort of a society that devolves into sort of unnecessary violence and this starts to happen, the Stamp Act crisis. Now it's limited, and then the legislation is repealed, so people, they sort of exhale then and relax. But there is a sense that the violence, in ways that it starts to radicalize New Yorkers, in the case of my book, I've studied New York, is that you know, the violence during the Stamp Act crisis maybe starts to radicalize New Yorkers. They start to see that the crowd actions has a play in sort of defending their liberties as British subjects. In places like Glasgow, they look at that violence as sort of too much. And perhaps, you know, that degree of violence doesn't promote freedom. It actually begins to limit the freedom of others. One aspect of your work that we haven't yet talked about, but I think we can tell based on our conversation thus far, is that in your book, Resisting Independence, you focus on four cities within the British Empire and the reactions to an involvement in the American Revolution. And you do this so that we can see what ideas of the revolution take hold and how loyalism developed. Brad. Would you tell us about the four different cities you studied? Kingston, Jamaica, Glasgow, Scotland, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and New York City. And Bill wonders why you chose these cities as cities to study, and whether your research led you to any unexpected findings or surprises about the sources of loyalism. 
That's a great question. I've gotten that a lot over the years when I've talked about my project with others. Not just why those four cities, but why not some other place? I mean, the list is amazing. Charleston, Savannah, these are all places that have been recommended to me. Charleston, Savannah, Philadelphia, Boston, of course, and all those. Belfast, Dublin, London, which I initially did try to study, which is too much. Bristol, Liverpool. And I would encourage others to do more research into this. I think there's a lot of interesting cities within the British Atlantic Empire, I think, that could really kind of give us new ways of thinking about the revolution. I chose these four for a couple of reasons. First, they geographically do well to represent the British Atlantic. I've got a mainland British city in Glasgow. I've got a very North Atlantic city in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've got one of the more prominent sort of port cities in the 13 American colonies in New York City. And then Kingston, of course, was the major sort of trading city for Britain's really crown jewel, the most valuable and thus most important colony in Jamaica. So I got a sort of a Caribbean representation. I wanted to make sure I had sort of geographical coverage here. So that's part of the reason. They're also connected, right, through trade, through a print culture. They're port cities. Their world faces the Atlantic. You know, I think today, certainly when I teach the American Revolution students, when I show a map of the British Empire, they always look at the Atlantic as sort of a barrier between Britain and the colonies, when in fact, it was a highway in the 18th century. And not just between mainland Britain and their various colonies, but among the colonies as well, like New Yorkers were heavily connected to Kingstonians or Jamaicans. Halijonians, which are people from Halifax, traded with people in Kingston and in New York. And of course, Glasgow, I mean, the rise of Glasgow in the 18th century it emerges by the middle of the 18th century, I would say is the second most important mainland British port city after London, is entirely dependent on its connections to the tobacco trade in the Chesapeake. So they're connected, which I think is interesting to think about how they're not just sort of isolated places, but they're rather part of this kind of British Atlantic community. They also, I think, individually have interesting backstories that collectively an interesting way to think about the impact of the American Revolution, you know, Glasgow, as I said, its rise as a city, its people are entirely connected to the colonies and dependent upon the colonial trade. Mercantilism is absolutely central to the sort of political identity of Glaswegians. And so the revolution presents a real challenge to that when colonists start to cut off trade and whatnot. Halifax is interesting. It's a small city, but it was founded in 1749 by the British as a Protestant bulwark against French Catholic Canada. It's inhabited almost entirely by the middle of the 1760s by New Englanders. There's a planter migration that occurs in the 1760s. About 6,000 New England planters moved to Nova Scotia. Something like two-thirds of the population of Halifax are New Englanders, or they actually refer to them as Americans. So it's a separate colony, but it's very much populated by people that have shared relations and culture with New Englanders. New York City, of course, is this really prosperous Atlantic port city, diverse city, politically contested city, and also like will become the sort of center of the British operation in the war. And I argue really the center of loyalism during the war. And of course, Kingston, you know, it's impossible not to think of Jamaica as part of the story because Kingston and Jamaica are the, as I said earlier, the most valuable colony in the empire. But it's interesting. There are about 15,000 white inhabitants in the colony of Jamaica in the 1760s and about 200,000 slaves. So it is a slave society more so than any place in the 13 American colonies. And so how does the American Revolution, the American War affect a society where, you know, you got white inhabitants who are committed to ideas of liberty and freedom and, and these sorts of things, but also live in a very much a slave society and they're dependent upon the protection of the British military for fears of slave insurrections. They're also surrounded by the French and Spanish in various islands around them. So there's threats of outsiders as well. So I think, you know, they all offer kind of an interesting story in and of themselves is what the revolution means to the people of each of these places. Yeah. And when we think of the American Revolution and how it took hold in mainland British colonies, you know, those 13 British colonies that become the United States, we tend to think about developing loyalism to the empire as a strictly American phenomenon, as a development that really happens within these 13 rebellious colonies. And yet I wonder... As Glaswegians, Halijonians, New Yorkers, and Kingstonians considered the American Revolution and whether their colony might join this reform movement and perhaps even the independence movement included in the revolution, what these colonists were thinking, you know, what consideration did they have to think about 
when they were choosing whether to remain loyal versus becoming a revolutionary city? I think in some cases, reluctantly, I think at first, I think it's important, I guess, to establish when these decisions are happening, right? And what I argue is that it's really not until the fall, winter of 74 into 75, where sides are starting to be taken. Now, why do they choose sides? In some cases, they choose a side because of sort of the particular situation of their community. So here's a good example. Kingston, your listeners may not know this, but in December of 1774, the Jamaica Assembly, which was controlled at that point by the Kingston merchants, petitions the king in favor of the American colonies. They actually write a petition to the king, which is published everywhere in the American colonies. It's often published on the front page of newspapers to encourage people to post it in their windows and so forth. This petition in which they actually defend the grievances of American colonists. You know, this is after the founding of the Continental Congress. You know, we're months away from the first battle at Lexington Concord. They petition in favor of these American colonists. But they also say in that petition, you know, we support them, but we're not going to be able to join them because I think the phrase they use is because of the peculiar situation of our island. And what they're referring to is the presence of 200,000 slaves. So I think in the case of someplace like Kingston, I think loyalty, at least initially, is somewhat reluctant. I think this is, again, back to this question of this being a civil war and also kind of me trying to muddy the waters of this sort of patriot loyalist divide is here you have a community that is loyal, but in some ways reluctantly so that they ideologically actually are agreeing with the issues raised by American colonists or the Continental Congress, but their circumstances don't allow them to actually participate or join in that. Now, the Americans hear this, and I think it's the Connecticut Assembly actually encourages Jamaica to establish a committee of correspondence. Like They're actually thinking in the spring of 1775 of bringing Jamaica into the fold, which is you know interesting. Like Just on the days before the actual war starts, that there's at least some that are thinking that Jamaica could possibly be a part of this. Halifax is very similar. As I said, it's populated by most of the New Englanders. And there is definitely 100% a radical sort of patriot political culture in Halifax in 75. And it's only stopped by those in charge. So Halifax is interesting in that the kind of merchant and political elite in Nova Scotia really control the province. And they're united in this effort to do this. And they have the backing of the British military, which is often present there. It's a major port of operation for the British Navy and military. And so in the winter of 74, 75, the governor of Nova Scotia actually puts out all these proclamations saying it's illegal to meet in groups. You know, you'll be arrested if you say anything critical of the king. He starts to require anyone arriving into the colony has to swear an oath of allegiance to the king. He forbids the local printer from publishing inflammatory essays or news. I mean, there's an attempt to squash any attempt at resistance in in Nova Scotia. So there's another place where at the start of the war, loyalism is... I mean, they're loyal in the sense that they remain a part of the British Empire, but ideologically, they again are in support of much of what the patriot movement's arguing. And that's a product, again, of the particular situation of these places. Now, in terms of the development of choosing sides in that moment of 74, 75, in terms of the immediacy of that decision, I argue a lot of it has to do with how they experience these events. And so what happens, the loyalism that emerges in, say, New York in the winter of 74, 75, is mainly reactionary. And it actually goes back to what Scottish people or Glaswegians people were saying in response to sort of the rioting during the Sandpack crisis, is that the loyalism that emerges in New York is not a loyalism that believes in like an absolutist monarchy, as the patriots characterize them, that they are absolutists and that they don't want to be free and these sorts of things. That's not true. What they argue, loyalists, is that their particular experience over the previous several months led them to loyalty. And that is that they had witnessed patriot crowds and committees and associations brutally treat anyone that just disagreed with them. That the violence of the revolutionary movement drove people to loyalism. Here's a good example is the Liberty Pole in New York City. And there are Liberty Poles all throughout the colonies. And when we think about Liberty Poles, we think, you know, these are Liberty Poles. They were put up by patriots. And we should celebrate these poles or Liberty Trees as places where Sons of Liberty gathered to sort of plan resistance to oppressive British policies. Well, the Liberty Pool in New York City, which was erected after the Stamp Act crisis, was the place where they often brutally beat loyalists. So if you're somebody that like sort of is watching this and thinking, okay, here's a you know, patriot movement that's supposed to be about freedom and 
liberty and it's fighting against the tyranny of the British state. They're physically beating somebody that disagrees with them at the liberty pole. You know, the irony of using the liberty pole as a place of torture and violence, it's the violence of the patriot cause, I think, that starts to lead some to begin to question the legitimacy of that movement. And loyalism really emerges out of that as a movement that's not as any less committed to freedom or liberty, but loyalists continue to believe in the winter of 74, 75, that monarchy and constituted government, legal government, are the best means to protect our freedom. Not these sort of what they describe as like vigilante sort of mobs or extra legal committees that are sort of violently treating their friends and neighbors and so forth. It's interesting because, as you point out, ideologically, a lot of these places that we think of as loyalist strongholds, Halifax, New York City, Kingston, ideologically, they think a lot like the revolutionaries. They believe that there was some sort of corruption in parliament. We could see this in the Stamp Act. And they'd like to see some reforms take place. So we have to wonder what really held back the people of Halifax, Kingston, and Glasgow from joining the American Revolution? Was it the violence? Or was it something else about the British Empire that they just found that they couldn't live without? Well, like I said, I think in Kingston and Halifax, I don't think that they were necessarily thinking that. I think at least at the start of the war, now there's a moment in the war where this changes, but at least at the start of the war, there isn't a convincing narrative to remain British, right? Or to remain committed to sort of the British state. The Patriots offer a really compelling argument. And you're right, Liz, that over the previous decade, I think most loyalists in New York didn't like the Stamp Act. They most likely also opposed the Townsend duties. I don't think that they were fans of the Boston Massacre. I don't think they were cheering on the British in the Boston Massacre, right? I say this somewhat jokingly, but this is how often loyalists are thought of as these sort of, you know, servile kind of British kind of lackeys. Loyalists are always presented this way. The fact of the matter is that I think most loyalists, and this is true not just in New York, but in Halifax and Kingston, and I would even argue in Glasgow, that the policies of the previous decade were unpopular, right? They didn't agree with them. And so when patriots begin to really push the narrative. I think Congress does this really aggressively in the winter of 74 and 75. And they do this, I argue, to go back to sort of my earlier argument is about what it meant to be British. I think we've underestimated the importance of the Quebec Act in really galvanizing the patriot cause in the winter of 74, 75. And remember, these are the months before the war begins. So there is no war yet. But the Quebec Act, which is a piece of legislation passed in Parliament in 1774 on the heels of the coercive acts, this is after the Boston Tea Party. So things are certainly escalating. And the, the Quebec Act, basically, you know, it did a couple of things. It expanded the size of the province of Quebec, but also in some form legalized the practice of Catholicism. Parliament did so in the spring of 74, largely because they were concerned with what's going on in the colonies. Quebec at that point, they had taken from France in the Seven Years' War. There's still, I think, roughly 40,000 French Catholics living in the province of Quebec, mostly around Montreal and Quebec. They wanted to ensure that these people would remain loyal. So unlike what they did in Nova Scotia, where they forcibly exiled the Acadians, they expelled the Acadian population, the French Acadian population in the 1750s from Nova Scotia, they adopt a more conciliatory policy with Quebec, and they try to draw in these French Canadians by allowing them to practice their faith, even though Britain remains a Protestant empire. And Congress and the American colonists lose their minds over the Quebec Act. I mean, it's really startling how obsessed they become over fears of why it was passed and what it means. They're convinced that it was passed because it was part of this concerted plan by the British ministry, who they had by that point seen over the last decade as corrupt and sort of hell-bent on bringing tyranny to the colonies through legislative policies. The Quebec Act, in many ways, was like a fulfillment of all of their fears that, of course, the ministry would favor Catholics in Canada because for the previous decade, American colonists argue, the ministry had been acting like Catholics, right? They'd been acting oppressively. And of greater concern was that the king, George III, actually gave his assent to this piece of legislation. A Protestant king given his assent to the legalization of Catholicism in the empire was actually against his oath as a monarch. He was required to actually defend the Protestant faith. And they lose their mind over this. They're convinced that this is part of a greater conspiracy to bring oppression to all of the colonies, to use Quebec and the 40,000 French Catholics there to actually arm them and have them descend on the colonies and murder Protestant men, women, and children. Really, the stories that are published in newspapers are just shocking. 
the extent that the colonists are led to believe that this is part of a plan to ultimately violently suppress Protestant British subjects in the American colonies. They even begin to argue that this is the beginnings of a third Jacobite rebellion, that the Bonnie Prince Charlie, the grandson of James II, who was dethroned in the Glorious Revolution, who's living in Italy at the time, there are stories circulating that he's going to come to Canada and lead at the bequest of George III and incite a Jacobite rebellion, like reestablish the Stuart dynasty in North America. It's really sort of mind boggling. So this is the problem. So this all happens in the winter of 74, 75. So if you're inclined not to sort of support this, what are you supporting then? Because if the patriots are arguing and Congress is arguing this through proclamations and addresses that the British parliament and the king through legislation over the previous decade have denied us our political rights, have suppressed our trade, our economy, so we're no longer prosperous. We're suffering at the hands of bad economic policies. And now they're destroying Protestantism. If in the 1760s to be British was to be you know, free, wealthy, and Protestant, the patriots are arguing you're not anymore. Your king's not that anymore. The parliament's not that anymore. So if you're a loyalist, how do you respond to that? This is, I think, really the challenge here is that, you know, what does it mean to be loyal in 1775? You can't say, well, I'm Protestant because your king's just favored Catholics. You can't say that I'm free because the policies of the previous decades say otherwise. And you can't say you're wealthy. So I think loyalism, back to your original question was, you know, why did they stay loyal? The reality is that in the winter of 75, with the exception of in New York, and the other three places, they're not really loyal. Even Glasgow. Glasgow merchants refuse to send a loyalty address to the king in 1775. Everywhere else in the mainland Britain, every other city is sending loyalty address to the king after the start of the war. And Glaswegians decide not to, in large part because they're like, well, you know, we don't know really what's going on there. And if we support the king, we're going to lose our trade in the colonies. In other words, the stakes aren't high enough yet for them. Ideologically, the stakes aren't high enough for Glaswegians to commit themselves to a war against their trading partners. Now, Brad, you mentioned the stakes were just not high enough for Glasgow or other cities throughout the British Empire to break with the British crown and empire in 1774 and 1775. So why don't we take a moment to appreciate our episode sponsor? And then, Brad, I am going to ask you what you think would have needed to happen to make those stakes high enough for these cities to join the revolutionary movement. Today's episode sponsor is Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is a company that believes in comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition, which is why they have developed their AG1 powder. AG1 is made from the highest quality ingredients in accordance with the strictest standards and is obsessively improved based on the latest science. That's all well and good, but what does it actually mean? It means that one scoop of Athletic Greens AG1 powder in one cup of water or two cups of water if you're like me and you want to turn that powder into a really smooth and fruity drink, one scoop of Athletic Greens AG1 powder in a glass of water means you're ingesting and absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, all of which help support your gut health, your nervous system, immune system, and provide you with energy and focus. It's great for athletes. A lot of athletes use it, but it's also great for people like me who just want to live a healthy life. You can think of AG1 as a multivitamin of sorts. Tons of people take all sorts of multivitamins to support their health. And it's important when you choose a multivitamin or supplement that you choose one with high-quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And AG1, it can be a lot cheaper than getting all those different nutritional supplements all by yourself. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop of AG1 powder in one cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills or supplements to look out for your health. Now, to make it easy, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash BFW. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash BFW to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Brad, what do you think would have needed to happen for the stakes to be high enough for cities like Glasgow, Halifax, and Kingston to join the revolutionary movement? It seems like places like Glasgow were really only a step or even a half a step removed 
from embracing the American Revolution. But their break with the empire just never happened. No, it doesn't happen. I think American historians often talk about this period at the start of the wars, this rage military, right? This sort of once the war begins, Americans sort of turn out in numbers and they form the Continental Army. And there's a real sense of like, we're committed to this cause and we're fighting and there's a just cause that we're behind. That doesn't happen in the British Empire. At the start of the war, there's apathy, except in New York. And I think in the case of the four cities I look at, New York City, there is a loyalist movement that emerges. But as I said earlier, it's reactionary. The loyalism that emerges in the winter of 74, 75, and I think it's important to say it's pronounced. Again, I get angry when people think of loyalists as sort of victims or that they think of loyalism as purely self-interest, that loyalists were just people that were wealthy colonists that had a vested interest in the empire or they were connected politically to the government or something. In other words, it's just self-interest that drove them. That's not true. They had ideas about how government should act, their rights and liberties as British subjects, what it means to be British. They understood this. And in the winter of 74, 75, or really the first months of 75, loyalists in and around New York City turn out in number to defend monarchy, to defend constituted government, legal government, and express a willingness to take up arms in defense of their king. Understand that that's not a small thing to do in the first months of 75. And remember, this is before the actual war has begun. So no one's actually fighting yet. But violence is already happening against suspected loyalists. Patriots are already tarring and feathering people. Most importantly in New York, and I think New York is so important to the loyalist movement because there is a printer there named James Rivington who publishes a newspaper that initially is actually, he attempts to sort of just publish both sides. He does increasingly become sort of the voice of a loyalist cause. He tends to publish essays and editorials that are mostly pro-government. His newspaper is the most widely read newspaper in the American colonies in the winter of 74, 75. But patriots begin to attack him. There's a movement that goes all the way down into North Carolina to stop reading his newspaper. Subscriber to Rivington's Gazette in Baltimore, Maryland, publicly renounced their subscription. And then they actually start to attack Rivington. They threaten to tar and feather him. Some of the pamphlets that he published, they tar and feather one of the pamphlets, they burn others. In other words, patriots, and I think it's really fascinating, right? Before the war begins, they aggressively try to silence their opponents by violent means, by other means. They have two options. They can either out-argue their enemies or they can shut them up. And they choose the latter. They choose to shut them up. And so the loyalism that emerges in this region, in and around New York, is one that's witnessing this. And I think it's amazing, right? Speaking for myself, like if I'm in a city where it's majority patriot support and I don't agree with them, and I'm asked by the Liberty Poll to publicly denounce the king, well, later on, there's a shoemaker, I think, named George Burks, who says basically like, screw you, God bless George III, I will fight in his army in front of a crowd of people. And he gets beat up, he gets robbed and beat up for this. Uh, Another guy in the spring of 75, William Cunningham, does the same thing. One thing I discovered late, it was actually a really pivotal moment in the development of this book project, is I discovered all these loyalist addresses that emerge in and around New York in the spring of 75, before the war begins. So like January, February, March of 75, loyalists start to gather in towns and villages and draft public proclamations in support of the king. The cover of my book is actually a carving Rivington did of George III's royal standard that appeared in a spring issue of his newspaper, 75 issue of his newspaper. And it's around a story that occurred in a small village outside New York City in which loyalists erected a king pole. Rather than a liberty pole, they erected a 75-foot king pole. And they put the royal standard at the top of it. And they write their names, they subscribe their names to this proclamation saying, we will defend the king and constitute government. But they're speaking against their reactionary. They're defending the king and constitute government because what they're seeing happen in the colonies is anarchy and violence. And they say, that's not liberty. That's not freedom. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're effective in the sense that there's a sizable loyalist population in places like this, but it's not a particularly effective message if you're not experiencing that violence necessarily. Although Glaswegians do somewhat respond to this, the violence that's sort of unfolding in the colonies. You know, there isn't an affirmative statement of loyalism. It's mostly we oppose what this patriot movement's doing. 
We know that from 1774 on, it becomes increasingly, you know, as you've talked about in New York City, it becomes increasingly dangerous to be a loyalist in the 13 British colonies that are rebelling against the empire. And we know from other scholars' work that these loyalists, a bunch of them, end up migrating to other places in the British Empire, like Halifax, Kingston, Glasgow, and London. Fred, did this migration, this loyalist migration, play any role in helping to keep these other British imperial cities loyal? Do they help keep the stakes from ever getting high enough? When the British military evacuates Boston in the spring of 1776, several thousand loyalists go to Halifax. And when they arrive, and I forget who it is, there's a gentleman I quote from Boston who arrives in there and he writes a letter saying, this is a patriot city we've just arrived into. We're not welcome here. We want out of here. Most of the people in this town are actually in support of the American cause. So it definitely reveals sort of the problems in Halifax of developing a loyalist cause at the start of the war. So I don't know if so much the migration, at least initially in the war, certainly after the war, the exile of loyalists has a tremendous impact on the empire. What I think is important that happens in terms of building a transatlantic loyalist cause is Rivington's newspaper. You know, Rivington eventually in the fall of 1775, so after the war begins, is actually forced out of the colonies of crowd or a mob, however you want to describe it, of patriots arrive at his print shop in fall of 75 and threaten to kill him. He escapes out and gets on a boat and goes to England. But when the British retake New York City in the fall of 76, he returns, I think, in the fall of 77. And he actually is given like a hero's welcome. He's processed through the city. It's like he's a statesman. It's like he's a returning governor or something. There's fireworks, there's military salutes. And he begins publishing his newspaper again, and it's carried everywhere. I think it does more than the migration of people. Rivington's newspaper becomes the mouthpiece of the loyalist cause for the empire, or at least the Atlantic Empire. And you pick up an issue of a Glasgow Mercury in 1778 or 79, and I can guarantee you they will have an excerpt from a story published in Rivington's Gazette. By 79 in Halifax, you can actually buy subscriptions to Rivington's Gazette. The printer of the Halifax Gazette is selling subscriptions to Rivington's newspaper. So I always thought it was strange. It seems like it would hurt his business. But it just tells you the importance of Rivington's newspaper. And what he's doing with his newspapers, he's publishing essays and editorials and reports of battles fought that are framed in favor of the government, of the British cause. And I think that that's the most effective in creating a transatlantic loyalist cause. So we've been talking about late 1774, early 1775. And how the stakes were just never high enough for cities and colonies outside of the 13 mainland British North American colonies to join the revolution. So I'd like for us to jump just a bit forward in time. Say it's early 1778. The revolutionaries have just won the Battle of Saratoga and word reaches the British Empire that France has joined the fray on the revolutionary side. And if you're British, you know that France's entry into the war means that its major ally Spain is not far behind. And the Netherlands, which has been pretty sympathetic to the revolutionary's cause, is likely to make some sort of official entry into the war. So all of this is to say that by 1778, there are major indications that the revolutionaries might actually win their independence from the British Empire. So Brad, with all these signs in place, what prevents the people of Halifax, Kingston, and Glasgow from joining the American Revolution? Have their ideas changed, you know, between these three years? Are they like New York City and in the midst of a British military occupation? Why is it that they just never join the independence movement? It's a great question. You're right. That's one way to think of it. Like the arrival of France and Spain and the Netherlands involvement and the success of the Patriot War effort, surprising success, right? Particularly with the Battle of Saratoga, the victory at Saratoga you might think would lead some, especially in places like Halifax and say Kingston, where they had previously expressed support for the American cause, that it might maybe lead to sort of greater support. And in Halifax, at least initially in the fall of 77, there is concern. As soon as news of Saratoga arrives, the governor there shuts the colony down. He's fearful of what this news is going to do. You know, there's still a decent population of Acadians in the area. There's an important Native American tribe, the Mi'kmaq people, who are a constant sort of threat to the British settlements in Nova Scotia. And he's worried that the Americans are going to win over their support, especially when France joins. So it's a bit of a mess there. But it's actually the opposite. The arrival of these allies for the Americans actually pushes these places towards loyalty, not rebellion. And it's because it's the French. 
in the spring of 1778, as the alliance with France becomes public knowledge, it's like an aha moment for the loyalist cause. You know, for a loyalist cause that for the previous three years of the war have been saying, you know, this patriot cause, it's violence, it's anarchy, it's led by these members of Congress who are all self-interested merchants or planters who are just doing this for their own gain. They don't have any legitimate reason. They're just fomenting rebellion and so forth to benefit financially ultimately from it. And then the patriot cause, the term that loyalists often use to refer to the patriot cause in those first years of the war are those that support it is that they're deluded. They've been deceived. They're duped, Americans. There's no real cause here. They've just been duped into fighting this war by a corrupt Congress. And so it's an unnatural revolution or rebellion because they're British subjects, right? Why would these British subjects fight us? We're all of the same people in the same nation. But when France joins, there's this aha moment because then what loyalists start to say is like, oh, right, this is why patriot crowds and committees and associations so arbitrarily and violently treated their opponents. This is why they shut down a free press in the colonies in 75, why they refused to allow their political rivals to speak publicly. They did it because they're actually like secret Catholics. And the irony, right, is that in 74, 75, patriots are arguing that the reason they were acting this way is because the British were the secret Catholics, right, with the Quebec Act. This, again, goes back to this kind of civil war, right? These are Protestant Britons, and they're fighting Protestant Britons. And so how do you make an enemy out of a friend? Well, in 1778 with the alliance, like loyalists are finally like, oh, right, this is why you guys acted that way, because you're actually just secret Catholics. And if you're willing to ally with France, you're not us. You're not a Protestant British subject. You're different. You're somebody else now. And this becomes especially true in a place like Kingston. Because not only do the Americans ally with France, but then they're down in the Caribbean working with the French to raid Jamaican plantations, to steal their slaves, to attack British trading vessels, to steal their cargoes, destroying the British Caribbean trade. Beginning in 78, there are reports in the Jamaican newspapers that American and French men are actually sneaking onto the island and giving weapons out to slaves to incite slave rebellions. So not only are they friends with the French, but they're actually working with the French to encourage slave revolts in our island. If in December of 1774, the Jamaican Assembly petitioned the king in favor of the Americans, but then said, we can't join it because we have 200,000 slaves on this island. And if we join a revolution, it's inevitably going to lead to slave revolt. The opposite is true in 78. They need to remain loyal because it's the Americans now that are trying to start a slave revolt actually trying to destroy our slave trade, trying to destroy our economy, threaten our freedom in terms of white colonists. A really famous example of this is Benedict Arnold. To this day, Benedict Arnold, I would say, is the most famous traitor in American history. Everyone knows who Benedict Arnold is, and everyone knows he was a traitor. Now, Arnold defects to the British not until the fall of 1780, though he begins earlier. And when he defects, the British are really winning the war. There's a moment in the summer of 1780 where There's a sense maybe that the British could actually, whatever victory could look like at that point, could win. They had taken Charleston, South Carolina. There was military successes in the Caribbean. And he defects and he goes to New York City and he publishes an address to the inhabitants of America. And they want to sneak it outside British lines, get it into the Patriot communities. And he wants everyone to read this. And he says, I supported the Patriot cause at the start. We had been treated unfairly. I agreed with this. They attacked us at Lexington Concord. The war began. We were fighting a defensive war to protect our rights as British subjects. Parliament, the king, had adopted oppressive measures, and we were simply defending ourselves. But then he says in the address, but in 1778, Parliament actually sent over a commission tasked with getting peace, establishing peace, the Carlisle Commission. And the Carlisle Commission was tasked with meeting with Congress, and their offer was everything. It was, if you end this war now, Congress, You'll get formal representation in parliament. The Congress can continue to exist. You'll control trade. It was like the wish list of everything the Patriots had wanted in 1775. They were willing to give. And Congress refused to even meet with the Carlisle Commission and instead announced an alliance with France. And for Arnold, he says in this address, so here we are. We had a chance in 78 to end this war and to get everything we wanted that we had complained about for a decade. And instead, members of Congress 
establish an alliance with Catholic French people. And he said, I can't stand for that. I can't stand for that. And so this is why he argues he defects. Now, patriots attack him in the press and they say, no, 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 he defected because he's selfish. He wasn't committed to the cause. He's a bad guy. It was all about self-interest. He wanted promotion. He was denied pay. It was all self-interest. He's a selfish human being. And this characterization has continued to the very day. There was probably an element of that. But already in the book is that what Arnold's actually saying, I think a lot of British subjects were saying in 1778, 79, is that how can you countenance a rebellion that was supposedly committed to freedom and liberty, but now you're allied with Catholic France? It's hypocrisy. It doesn't make sense. When we read your book, Resisting Independence, we get a clear sense that the ideas of the American Revolution and whether or not to join the revolution wasn't just a question belonging to the 13 British colonies that rebelled. It was actually a question that many people in different parts of the first British Empire considered throughout the American Revolution. And Jeremy wonders whether the revolution and considerations of what it meant to be British and loyal to the British crown and empire had any impact on the institution of the British monarchy. Did King George III and his family ever consider that a widespread rebellion across all 26 of Britain's North American colonies might happen on his watch? Or that he might be deposed because of the revolution? You know, he was definitely a supporter of the war. I mean, Andrew O'Shaughnessy's most recent book really sort of demonstrates, I think, really well how important George III was to the war effort and commitment to the war against the colonies. He's definitely supported the war and wanted to crush the rebellion. Was there ever threats that he'd be deposed? I don't think it ever went that far, but it's certainly true that throughout the period of the war, from 75 up to really 1780, that the impact of the revolution or the rebellion was affecting all of the empire and leading to all sorts of troubles elsewhere. And most famously in Great Britain, in the summer of 1780, there's a massive riot in London called the Gordon Riots, which I write about and I refer to it as a battle of the American War for Independence, in which upwards of 700 or more people die in five days of violent rioting in the city all in response to the attempt by Parliament beginning in 1778 to repeal some laws against Catholics because they wanted to get Catholics living in England, Scotland, and Ireland to be able to serve in the military now that they're fighting this big war against France and then Spain and the Americans. And so the anti-Catholic relief movement that emerges in the British Isles is especially pronounced in Scotland. In Glasgow, there are a series of riots in 78 and 79. And there's a real sense that Scots or Glaswegians are on the verge of some kind of rebellion. I don't think that that rebellion is necessarily aligned with the Americans, although ironically, Glaswegians write in 1778 in response to the Catholic relief bills, they say there's a long list of evidence that the British ministry is in favor of Catholics. And we only have to go back to the Quebec Act to show this. First, they relieved Catholics in Quebec in 74, and now they're relieving Catholics in the British Isles. Like they're up to something here. So they are in some ways attaching themselves to sort of the, at least the origins of the American cause. But I don't think their rebellion necessarily would have joined with the Americans. But, you know, from the view in London, George III's view, you know, the empire's on fire by 1780, 7980. Rebellion of 13 colonies, battles being fought in the Caribbean, riots and protests in mainland Britain. It's a real disaster. It really is all tied to this question as to what it meant to be British. This is, I think, the reason why Americans ultimately revolt is that they are convinced in 75 that the king and his government had abandoned this British identity, that the Americans, and this is somewhat confusing, possibly the listeners, that the Americans actually revolt in 75 initially because they argue we're more committed to being British than the government is. We're trying simply to defend our rights and liberties as British subjects. This is all Glaswegians are saying in 1779 and 80 in response to the anti-Catholic relief bills. This is all Jamaicans are saying when they're trying to defend their island from American and French attacks and Spanish attacks. So it's a real mess. It doesn't let up for some time. Brad, before we move into the time warp, what is the one idea or piece of knowledge about the American Revolution and the different considerations when it came to choosing a loyalty during this period that you'd really like us to walk away from this conversation better understanding? If there's one thing I could convince your listeners of is that loyalists were not cowards. They were not without an ideology or beliefs about what it means to be free 
responsibilities of government. Loyalists were committed to something. They had a notion or an idea to how society should function and what the best kind of system of government was to protect one's freedom, to promote prosperity. And I think in understanding that, what I hope listeners can take from that is that the revolution is messy and difficult. I think we too often have sort of a generalized view of the revolution as good guys versus bad guys, that the American patriots were freedom lovers and the British loved tyranny. And it wasn't that simple. Events of the period were contingent on other events and attitudes were shaped in the moments in response to what was going on. And that to be a patriot, to be a loyalist, certainly at the start of the war, was not so clear cut as to who was bad and who was good. And it's an exercise I often do with my students, again, is that I ask them at the start of the war which side they would take. And they don't know. They often don't know. And I think that was true of the colonists. It wasn't so obvious that the patriots were fighting the good cause. And I think we tend to look backwards too much in thinking about the American Revolution, that it was right and good. And I think that taking this loyalism and loyalists more seriously allows us to realize that it was far more complicated and sides were not so clear, and ideas of who was good or bad weren't so clear to people at the time. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently, or if someone had acted differently. opinion, Brad. How might the American Revolution have been different if Kingston, Halifax, and Glasgow had joined the revolutionaries and become part of the independence movement? That's a great question. You know, the inclusion of Glasgow, I would say, really forces us to think outside the box here because I love living in Scotland, so I would love if I could just go there more easily if it was part of the United States. It's really hard, I think, to actually think of Glasgow as having joined the rebellion. But I would say it's interesting to think about So the government decided to not repeal these Catholic relief laws. And so things calmed down a bit in Scotland. Had they actually forced Catholic relief on Glaswegians at the end of the war, I suspect we would have had some kind of rebellion. And, you know, the history of Scotland and England has always been tenuous. It was tenuous in the 18th century. So it's certainly one could wonder whether or not that would have drove a movement for Scots to break away from England. I think the more interesting thing is to think about Kingston and Halifax. Halifax, I think, is a really obvious inclusion. And in fact, many Halogenians wish they would have joined. It was often referred to as the 14th colony. And I think there was a real chance for it to have joined. I don't think without the presence of the British military or the control of the local elite, they would have joined. And it would have certainly geographically given the early United States a dominance of the eastern coast. It would have certainly made Britain's hold of Quebec more complicated had the United States also had Nova Scotia. And I think Kingston or Jamaica is really fascinating. Had they joined the rebellion, it would certainly have expanded the slave interest in the early national period in terms of the governance of the United States. It would have been really fascinating to see how they impacted American politics. It would have been great for the American economy to have access to Jamaica and the prosperous sugar and slave trade. Though I think had Jamaica joined the American Revolution, I think the Americans would ultimately have had a really difficult time keeping Jamaica. Because you can guarantee that in the aftermath of the war, the British would have tried to retake it. It was just too valuable not to try to retake. I think the Americans would have really time resisting a British attack. And I think if they didn't try, the French or the Spanish would. I mean, Jamaica was just way too prosperous for European nations not to make a play at. So, Brad, what are you researching and writing about now? So, I've just started a new project that actually grew out of just a very small bit of this book where I talked about these American privateers in the Caribbean and their efforts to disrupt the British trade, capture British ships. To a degree, American historians are familiar with this story of efforts by the Americans to not just disrupt trade, but to work with the French to acquire weapons and ammunition and military supplies for Washington's army in the first couple of years of the war, because Washington's army, they struggled to get supplies. And so what happens is the secret committee of correspondence in Congress sends a man by the name of William Bingham down to French Martinique with a packet of letters of Mark, which are basically congressional documents saying that anyone that has a ship, if you want to fight in the cause of the American independence, 
that whatever you capture, if you can capture a British ship, you can keep the cargo. And so he does this and he ends up using those privateers to attack British ships. They bring their cargoes to Martinique. He's selling those cargo in exchange for weapons and ammunition that they then sends back to the colonies to fight against the British. And I want to look more into that. So I've started a project looking more into the first two years of the war and Bingham's effort to wage this kind of privateer war in the Caribbean, which I think is, it hasn't been studied in a long time. And I know it's enormously important to the American war effort early on. And it's a genuine war. I mean, they effectively destroy the British slave trade by 1778. There's a special parliamentary session in February 1778 to address the impact of the privateers on the British Caribbean trade. Bingham does his job. And I think we need to understand better what it is he's doing down there. Where can we find more information about you, Brad, and how we can reach out to you if we have more questions? The easiest way to get a hold of me is through the Fresno State History Department website. I have a web page. If you go to csufresno.edu, find the History Department page. We have a faculty page there, and you'll see my bio there. And I have my email address and phone number there. I welcome any emails, phone calls. Hopefully, you picked up in this interview. I enjoy talking about loyalists and loyalism, and I would love to talk with anyone that shares a similar interest. Brad Jones, thank you for joining us and for helping us consider loyalism in the broader British Atlantic world during the American Revolution. Thanks, Liz. I had a great time. Thanks to the first historians of the American Revolution, we often view loyalists as cowards, as people who lacked original ideas about how government should protect liberties and freedoms and civil society. But as we just heard from Brad, this was not actually the case. The idea that loyalists were cowards and lacked a consistent ideology about good government developed because the first historians of the American Revolution were angry, and they were trying to unite the new American people together so that they could help get the new United States nation underway. And a surefire way to unite people together is to blame someone else for their collective troubles and past difficulties. So these early, early American historians of the American Revolution scapegoated and blamed loyalists for the new nation's troubles. But as we just discussed with Brad, those who adopted loyalism as part of their identity weren't actually bad people or caused the Americans' troubles. In fact, if we think of what Brad just revealed to us, we can see that loyalists had many ideas about how to create and maintain a free and civil society through good constituted government and Protestant ideals. In the eyes of the loyalists, it was the revolutionaries who had dispensed with the civil and free society they enjoyed under the British crown by violently revolting against parliamentary taxation and violently suppressing anyone who dared to offer a different opinion from those held by the revolutionaries. And this is something that we can clearly see in Brad's recounting of the New York City Stamp Act riot and the ways Britons across the British Atlantic Empire recoiled when the revolutionaries allied with France, Great Britain's longtime Catholic enemy. Now, another interesting view that we can take away from our conversation with Brad is how loyalism was not just an ideology that belonged exclusively to British Americans who lived in the 13 rebellious colonies. Loyalism was an ideology adopted by many Britons across the Atlantic world. And just like the loyalists in the rebellious colonies, Britons in Jamaica, Nova Scotia, and Scotland also had to consider what loyalism meant to them. What did it mean to be loyal to the British crown in Parliament? What did it mean to be British? And what makes a loyal Briton different from an American revolutionary or a British subject. Just like Loyalist Americans, Loyalist Britons had to consider the British government and culture, the ideas and actions of the American Revolution, and their place within the British Empire before they decided what aspects of British society and government they wished to support and which aspects of British government and society they wished to decry. They also had to consider if what they wished to decry and disagree with about the British system was a big enough problem that only a violent revolution could reform. Look for more information about Brad, his book, Resisting Independence, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 330. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. If you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music.
This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, our study of the American Revolution doesn't always dive into loyalism. So as we consider future episode topics for this show, what more would you like to know about loyalism and loyalists? Let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and it's sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.